<laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome back to For the Booze. For the Booze. For the booze. Yay. <laughs> We're back. We're back. A little more of a regular week, I guess. Yes. You know, now that, yes. again, happy Mother's Day to all you mommies out there. All the moms of all kinds, yes. All you mommies out there. Let me not be creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> but, you know, happy Mother's Day. I hope, I hope everybody had a, a great uh, Mother's Day. And uh, we we really didn't do much. We just kind of hung out at the house. But it was a nice, quiet day. It was. It was absolutely lovely. I enjoyed doing absolutely nothing and napping, like, twice. It was yeah. great. Megan's that she's that girl. She she doesn't she doesn't like a lot of excitement. So I don't. I'd rather just sit and chill and watch TV and fall asleep. That's right. Yes, and I appreciate that as well. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're you know we do this show, but I, I think we're really kind of homebodies. We're oh, really kind of. Well, you know, oh. like I think people think like we might be like these outgoing people, and we're just not. Well, no, we're, we're not. not. We we're do we do a lot of like. And staying in and, you know, the, our perfect night usually tends to be like a, you know, like let's dinner find, and TV, find, let's find something to watch. Yeah. You know, or play or, a game or yeah, something. Something to that effect. But this week we are, you know what? I want to remind everybody that if you've ever wondered about a monthly subscription service, something that actually pertains to the topics that, you know, we talk about, or if you like true crime, or if you like horror in general, then Creepy Crate is probably going to be the service for you. It it's is. thirty nine ninety nine a month, and I've seen these boxes be open, and I'm kind of impressed with them. I'm, we're still, we haven't got ours yet, but it is coming, and I'm, I kind of want to wait to open it. When we're doing an episode. So, I would love to do that. You know, just like we're not going to make an episode of us opening one, but I just think it would be cool to maybe just, you know, at the beginning of an episode be like, this is what we got. Yeah. So you guys can know what to expect. You know, so it's a really awesome service. I'm super amped about doing this and getting it. I, I know, cannot me too. wait. You know, I am so excited. I probably. Creepy great. We're going to have to take turns on who gets to read the book that comes in there. I know. But luckily for us and you guys. You know, they decided to partner with us and and they would like to offer you a, a discount for your first order for just listening to the show and saving money, being a booze crew. That's right. And when you go there, uh, you go to creepy crate dot. I think we leave a store. We just go to creepy dot com and sign up and then you can type in the promo code booze five B O O S and the number five. That's right. And that'll get you five dollars off your first order. We're going to get you started on your monthly subscription. The creepy crate. That's right. That's right. Tell them we sent you. So excited. But before we move on much farther this week, I want to continue the rattling chain story from, his name is Keon Washington. This came in through a different email. I'm not real sure how this got uh, mixed up, but this is the second part. I have both parts in front of me, but you're not getting both. You're not getting the rest of it today. Aww. You get part two today. Oh, and then we will give you part three next week. Well, part one with rattling, dragging oh, it was a good chains story. outside your bedroom door. Uh, no, thanks. Still my favorite. So, my favorite part of the story is still going to be squiggly TV. So that, that's, 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 that's just me. <laughs> but here we go. Three days later, I'm sitting in my room again, playing my PlayStation. I heard some scratching on the wall outside my bedroom. I just thought it was a big mouse or something, so I ignored it. That is until I heard the chain coming down the hallway again. I got scared again and jumped under my covers again. I did not know what to do. I was scared, but I knew my mom and grandma would not believe me. I have been known to watch scary movies and be afraid to sleep at night. They would have just said, it was my overactive imagination, but it wasn't, and I was terrified. I was so scared that I couldn't sleep, and I had to pee, but was too scared to get up and go see, so I held it all night. I was glad when the sun came up. I talked to a friend about it at school, and he told me to swing a metal baseball bat at it. 
Metal can hurt ghosts. Remember, I'm like 13, and we didn't know any better. So I stayed up as late as I could the next few nights. During the week, I had school, and I couldn't stay up as late. The next couple of nights, I heard some scratching, but no chains. Until finally, one Friday night, I heard the chains again. This time, I was ready to face my fear. And that's where we'll pick up next week. No! Oh my god, my heart was pounding. (laughs) I was like waiting to find out what happened. I'm very Ah! curious, because I'm trying not to read ahead. I want to get the experience of everybody. I'm curious what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. Because the last time I checked, I don't think you can hit a ghost with a baseball bat. I don't think I've ever heard of metal being the thing, but hey, you know. Well, you know, iron for fairies, I believe it is, but this is a ghost as far as we know. So we're just going to have to see. And I love editing these stories because they're such like real world, like uh, this is the kind of story I would expect from a Goosebumps book. Yes. So when I go to edit these, they're a lot of fun, like with the chains and scratching. So I I really enjoyed doing the last one, Mm -hmm. like so much that I never usually tell you, hey, Megan, listen to Uh, this. Yeah, you got to listen to this. (laughs) And I did that with this one. There's just something about it. Like it just reminds me. Of a goosebump story, and I love it. I love it so. Super great Keon, story. We appreciate you sending thank that you. in. Thank you, and thank you. We will be finishing up your story, your your trilogy, the saga of the dragging chains, next week. Now, moving forward, we are going to do a story this week on a place that I didn't even know existed, and it's odd because it's right here in the Sunshine State where we live. That's right. I came across this by chance. You guys out there may think that I know pre, before what we're doing, that I know what we're going to do, but I don't. I am the kind of person I like to take to the internet, and I like to read stories about haunted places that I've never heard of. Maybe not specifically for the show, but just to read them. Mm -hmm. And I came across this place, and I was like, I've never heard of this. And it was such an interesting story that I decided it fit well into our Haunted Houses series. So uh, we had to cover it. It's a little bit of a different one, like not so different that we haven't had one like this before, but I'll explain it at the end where it's a little different from the norm of the stories that we end up doing. But this week we're traveling to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, and we are going to visit the famous Stranahan House. That's right. The Stranahan House which is also the oldest standing building in all of Fort Lauderdale. Wow. And it has not as long of a history, say, as a lot of places that we do, but it's interesting, and you'll see why. There's, It's just different. I don't want to give away too much, so that's all I can say. So you guys will have to buckle up and get ready for uh, the history behind it all. The history? And then the mystery. That's right. Megan came up with that about a year and a half ago. I did. I still (laughs) like it a lot. (laughs) So what do you say we get into this? All right. I say let's do it. Today's story takes place in Fort Lauderdale, a coastal city located in the U.S. state of Florida, which sits 30 miles north of Miami along the Atlantic Ocean. It's the county seat of, and also the largest city in Broward County with a population of 182,760 as of the 2020 census, making it the 10th largest city in Florida. After Miami, Fort Lauderdale is the second principal city in the Miami metropolitan area. Built in 1838 and first incorporated in 1911, Fort Lauderdale is named after a series of forts built by the United States during the Second Seminole War. The forts took their name from Major William Lauderdale, younger brother of Lieutenant Colonel James Lauderdale. The development of the city did not begin until 50 years after the forts were abandoned at the end of the conflict. Three forts named Fort Lauderdale were constructed, including the first at the fork of the New River, the second at Tarpon Bend on the New River between the present-day Coley Hammock and Rio Vista neighborhoods and the third near the site of the Bahia Mar Marina. Known as the, quote, Venice of America, Fort Lauderdale has 165 miles of inland waterways across the city. In addition to tourism, 
Fort Lauderdale has a diversified economy, including marine, manufacturing, finance, insurance, real estate, high technology, avionics and aerospace, film, television production. The city is a popular tourist destination with an average year-round temperature of about 75.5 degrees and 3,000 hours of sunshine every year. Greater Fort Lauderdale, encompassing all of Broward County, hosted more than 13 million overnight visitors in 2018. Each year, nearly 4 million cruise passengers pass through its Port Everglades, making it the third largest cruise port in the world. With over 50,000 registered yachts and 100 marinas, Fort Lauderdale is also known as the yachting capital of the world. But our story today will begin about 17 years before the city would be incorporated. Stranahan House is the home of Fort Lauderdale pioneers Frank and Ivy Stranahan. Now, the house was built in 1901 as a trading post and converted into a residence for the Stranahans in 1906. And as of today, the house is the oldest surviving structure in Broward County. In 1893, at the age of just 27, Frank Stranahan was hired by his cousin to manage his camp and ferry at Tarpon Bend, located on the New River. He would quickly establish his own trading business with the Seminole Indians and gain the reputation of being what many considered a fair businessman. Arriving by dugout canoes, large groups of Seminole families would camp at the post for days at a time. Eventually, in 1894, Frank would acquire 10 acres of land for his own commercial interests and would move the trading post farther west along the river. The property became the focal point of the tiny New River settlement, and Stranahan would become its postmaster. The things in the area went great, and by 1899, the community had grown large enough to qualify for a teacher from the County Board of Education. 18-year-old Ivy Julia Cromarty of Lemon City, what is now known as Little Haiti, was hired at $48 a month for the job. Ivy Julia Cromarty was born in White Springs, Florida, to August and Sarah Cromarty on February 24, 1881. Her father was a teacher based in Central Florida, During the development of the southern part of the state, the Cromarty family continued to move further south. During one part of her childhood, the family lived near a settlement named Owens on the Peace River, around 15 miles from Arcadia. They would move to Juneau, Florida, and then later to Lemon City, where her schooling was completed. She sought to become a teacher immediately and trained through the summer following graduation. She was assigned to work at the school in Fort Lauderdale. She would arrive prior to the completion of the construction of the school building and stayed with a school trustee and his family for several months. Excited about the new growth, community members would build the one-room schoolhouse for Ivy and her nine students. Frank and Ivy would get to know each other during the five months Ivy lived and taught at the settlement. They would marry on August 16, 1900 at her family home, And, as was customary for married women at the time, Ivy would give up her paid position to become a housewife. Though she gave up her paid position, she did not, however, give up her teaching aspirations. She would instead turn her attention to the Seminole children and would offer them informal lessons at the trading post that respected the tribe's traditions. Her approach quelled skeptical tribal elders' fears and formed the basis for her lifelong friendship with the Seminole people. Frank would build the present-day Stranahan House in 1901. The lower floor would serve as a trading post while the upper floor would serve as a community hall. By 1906, Frank's business had expanded to include a general store and even a bank, and he would also build a new building closer to the railroad which had arrived in 1896. The old trading post was renovated as a result into a residence for the Stranahans. As Frank's business grew, so did the settlement. According to the 1910 census report, there were 142 people living in the town. 
Frank and Ivy would take on many leadership roles in the social and civic life of their developing the city. Ivy, for instance, would help found the Women's Civic Improvement Association, later the Women's Club of Fort Lauderdale. And throughout the rest of her life, she would be involved with virtually every civic and social cause within the city. Renamed Fort Lauderdale after the army forts that had been built during the Seminole Wars, the area was incorporated in 1911. Frank donated land for many public projects. With this new name, Frank would end up selling the trading company in 1912 to focus on real estate and banking, while Ivy would become president of the Florida Equal Suffrage Association in 1916. In 1924, due to her close relationship with the Seminoles, the federal government would seek out Ivy and ask for assistance in persuading the tribe to move to a reservation. Because of her close relationship with the Seminole people, she would be successful in her efforts. By 1924, the expansion of Fort Lauderdale had begun in earnest, and there was a pressure for the Seminoles to move to the approved area set aside as a reservation. She entered their existing camp and convinced members of the group to join her on an expedition to the Denea Reservation. Ivy arranged for the Seminoles to be paid to make the reservation habitable and began transporting work parties to and from the location. She arranged for timber to be delivered courtesy of the Indian Commissioner at Fort Myers and, by the end of the year, several homes, a school, and an administrative building had been built on the site and all the Seminoles had been moved. She had promised that once moved, they would not need to move again. However, within 10 years, this promise was broken as the government was looking to move the Seminoles to the Brighton Reservation. Ivy would fight the order, and it was eventually revoked. She continued to work on introducing Christianity into the Seminoles and successfully integrated them into the Southern Baptist Convention. In 1926, Florida's land boom would collapse. Frank unfortunately suffered extreme economic reverses that were worsened over the next three years by two devastating hurricanes. By the time the Great Depression began and Florida caught up with the rest of the nation in 1929, it had already become accustomed to the economic hardship. In 1929, the Mediterranean fruit fly invaded the state and the citrus industry suffered. A quarantine was established and troops set up roadblocks and checkpoints to search vehicles for any contraband citrus fruit. Florida citrus production was cut by about 60%. Adding to Frank's distress was the knowledge that friends and associates who had invested with him were financially ruined as well. And on May 22, 1929, deeply depressed and in poor health and just finding out he had cancer, Frank Stranahan would attempt suicide by leaping off of his house. He would be taken away to a mental asylum shortly after. Ivy begged the authorities to release Frank and have him pass at home with his family. And they agreed, and shortly after, Frank would succumb to his depression and drown himself in the new river in front of his home. He tied an iron gate to his ankle and jumped in the water, ensuring that he wouldn't be able to float back to the surface. Shortly after Frank's death, a young Seminole girl came to see Ivy, but mysteriously, she would collapse in the doorway and die. Then, the younger sister of Ivy, who they called Pink, later moved into the house when she was seven months pregnant. She hoped that after three failed pregnancies, she would finally have a live birth. After hearing about her cheating husband, she went into premature labor and gave birth to a stillborn, and then she would die in the hospital. Now, Ivy's brother Albert moved in and after living a wild life, died after contracting tuberculosis at a party. Ivy's father, Augustus Cromarty, got very sick towards the end of his life. Ivy would take him in, and he would also die in the guest room shortly after. Ivy would go on, making ends meet by renting out rooms of her home and eventually leasing the lower floor to a series of restaurants. 
she gradually returned to her civic activism. Among her many accomplishments, she became a long-term member of the city's planning and zoning committee, successfully lobbied for the Homestead Exemption Law, established the Friends of the Seminoles and founded Broward County chapters of the Red Cross and Campfire Girls. Ivy remained in her home until her death on August 30th, 1971, at the age of 90. The house was left to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which Ivy had been a member since 1915, and it was registered with the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society in 1973. With the last restaurant closed, the Historical Society of Fort Lauderdale would buy the house from the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1979, and for the next four years, a construction project began to restore the house to its 1915 appearance. In 1981, the house became its own corporation, with a separate board of trustees. The house opened to the public in the spring of 1984, and today, the house offers daily tours via their website. While an old historic house museum isn't exactly what you think of when visiting the beach, it's hard to deny the Stranahan house's impact on the community. So, if you're in the area and want to see for yourself... Go ahead and pop in, and who knows, maybe Frank or Ivy themselves will greet you at the door. Wow, that was great. First of all, Mm. uh, okay, Ivy. Ivy was get it, girl. She's a boss chick. What? Ivy was a boss chick. And in like a time where women weren't supposed to be boss chicks. Let me tell you, like. Wow. She she was more of a boss chick than boss chicks are boss chicks today. I'm saying. Like, she's she's a bad lady in the best of ways. Like, wow. there wasn't anything that she couldn't do. Right. Like and she, she just did it. She's like, okay, cool. This I've, is what we're doing. I've seen pictures of her, okay? And uh, the only thing I could think of when I look at her, she looks just like uh, Lorraine Warren. Like, same hairdo. She looks, just, really? she looks just like her. Wow. And I try to imagine... Back in the early 1900s, that a little tiny white lady that yeah. looks like Lorraine Warren just walking onto seminal, you know, grounds. And she's like, and just, hey, what's up? Yeah, becoming basically family with them. Because that's what everything I read was like. She was really tight with the seminal people. Right. And, and not only that, but, you know, she was doing a lot of the stuff that women were fighting for long before women were fighting for it. Right. Absolutely. You know, like becoming board members and starting committees and and getting laws passed like she was doing all this decades before women were even like we want rights too yeah oh yeah you know get it ivy so i mean she really i I don't know how famous she is in, in in the annals of history but i feel like as far as like women's history goes she should be up there absolutely like she is absolutely. a freaking she is a boss lady like in the best way and that's what i was getting at before where like we, when people in the paranormal community know that most of the places that they know about have like this dark history where mm-hmm. tragic and terrible things have happened. People getting tortured and murdered, and we've covered satanic cults more than once. And this place isn't like that. This place was actually like a loving family home, and the the real like uh, bad things, not bad things, but the real sad things, mm-hmm. didn't happen until somebody's life fell apart. And their mental health got the better of them. Right. And they tried to take their own life and then eventually succeeded in taking their own life. Or her dad, who was just really old and well, just exactly. passed away in the home. And at least he was with his daughter, you know? Well, and that's the th- the reoccurring theme about yeah. this house is that you're going to come across is that a lot of people believe the reason that it's haunted is because it's the ghost of people who are part of the family and they want to treat everybody who comes in like part of the family. Ooh. So like these aren't these these aren't like evil ghosts yeah. that are allegedly here. These are the best case scenario you can think of. These are two spirits that linger that are still gracious hosts in the afterlife. Wow. So I you know this one's just it's different. It really is. This one's this one I mean this could have been like a I don't know. This could have been a, a Christmas one or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> because there's just nothing really evil about. There's nothing evil about these people. These people were amazing people. Yeah. Frank was a hardworking businessman who who made fair deals to get to where he was. He grew the town of one of the 
probably one of the most popular cities yeah, in America. It is. Fort Lauderdale. I don't care where you live. You know what Fort Lauderdale is. Uh, we went through that port when we went on our cruise. We did. That is right. That, that is where we went. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. That is where we went. And we ate at this little Cuban restaurant. Oh, oh my God. God. It was the best yes. Cuban food I've ever had. It was so good. But I good. thought we were going to die there. Oh, I know. Because the people running it, it, I feel like it was a front for something else because they, they looked very shocked that somebody came in to eat, even though the food was the best Cuban food I've ever had in it my was life. phenomenal. But they looked like we were out of place and it was kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> It was really good, though. Yeah, it was. But but because of these people specifically, Fort Lauderdale is what it is today. Yeah. Like, these people are responsible for Fort Lauderdale and what it is now. Mm-hmm. So without these people, one of the biggest and best-known cities in the country wouldn't exist the way it does today. That's so crazy. And in the best way. There's no blood trails. Right. And I love that because people love to make fun of Florida. I, and I, granted, I live here. I make fun of it. Probably more than the rest of you, because it's a ridiculous place to live. <laughs> the, the worst stuff happens here. So it's nice to hear a story that isn't lined in, you know, just... Crap. Well, just murder and blood and torturous stuff. Like, you know, I, I would think of old-timey Florida, like the LaLaurie Mansion, or, uh, you know, like the stuff we hear, heard about that way back in the beginning of this show, like Taunton State Hospital. Yeah. Like, that's the kind of stuff I expect to hear when I hear Florida history. But this was this was a like a happy surprise and and like I loved I loved reading this so that's why we did this one and you know what the ghost stories are honestly just as good oh yes this is gonna be this isn't if you're here for dread and blood this isn't the one <laughs> this is just wait till next week yeah this is yeah probably <laughs> this is more of a this is just a happy this is this is basically the happy I love this me too. I love it. Me too. So with that being said, I think we are going to go ahead and take a break. What do you think? Ugh, fine. (laughs) Okay. We'll be back after these ads. (laughs) (laughs) And now, Booze Crew, back to the show. It is believed by many that people that could kill themselves are sometimes afraid to go on to the other side because of what may await them there. It is believed that they relive their suicide or possibly wander around becoming a lost soul. Frank Stranahan, a son of a minister, suffered from what we know now is depression and a broken spirit not only because of his financial losses and the guilt of letting down his investors, mostly friends and family, but also because he was dying of cancer, as he would later find out, unable to do anything to start over again to repay them. He would tie himself to a heavy metal object and throw it into the river. In these relatives who lived in the family home, just across the river from them, saw Frank jump and tried to save him, but he ended up drowning. People who die before their time sometimes decide to stay in this world, not ready to go to the other side for a variety of reasons. Children and other souls have chosen to stay where they are familiar. A very young Seminole girl went to visit Miss Ivy but mysteriously collapsed in the doorway and died. People who have unfinished business with this world choose to ignore the light and stay. Ivy's sister, Pink, came to stay with Ivy because her husband was on a business trip. She had lost her last three pregnancies and had hoped that this pregnancy would result in a live child. Upon hearing that her husband was a two-timer, and had had another woman who was the real wife. She went into premature labor, and once again, the baby was stillborn. She died a week later in the parlor of the Stranahan house because of bleeding. She had refused to go to the hospital. Paranormal investigator 
John Mark Carr, in his book, Haunted Fort Lauderdale, wrote that perhaps she is still trying to get her husband arrested because of the EVPs he's recorded in the parlor. People who can't let go of the unfairness of their death sometimes stick around to do what they were doing before they died. In some instances, they complained, are resentful, or get chuckles by teasing the living. Ivy's brother, Albert, loves the fact that his room, the smallest guest room, had its own entryway. Being a bit of a black sheep in a rebellious mood, he got involved with a wild crowd, enjoying the party scene, the drinking, and the loose women. An unintended consequence was that he caught TB from a prostitute. He would die six months later in his room at the Stranahan house. He is allegedly still sulking and resentful that his choices led to his end, but can be playful and a bit inappropriate at times. (laughs) Sometimes people stay in this world after their death because loved ones are staying and they still want to care for them. Ivy was a very giving person, living what she believed and using her gifts to benefit others. She took care of her family members. As so many members of her family have decided to spend their afterlife here, she has chosen to stay as well. Augustus Cromarty, Ivy's father, was very sick and Ivy took him in and had him stay in the large guest room where he would unfortunately die. They say Augustus was very fond of his daughter Ivy, so it surprises no one that his spirit may have stuck around for her. They claim there are six entities that make the Stranahan house their home. One little girl and five members of the Stranahan clan. Upon entering the Stranahan house, there is a welcoming aura, a friendly, cordial atmosphere, as both entities of Mr. and Mrs. Stranahan are claimed to still reside here. The spirit of Frank Stranahan must be pleased to see his labor of love in such good condition, and that it is now even a museum. Frank had hosted many events at the house, so tourists coming in to look wouldn't upset him at all, though vagrants don't fit that category. Allegedly, when homeless people have tried to sleep on the first floor veranda, An angry male spirit would bang on the outside of the house and sometimes, literally, chase them off the property. Both staff and visitors have seen the apparition of Frank Stranahan, as he must have had the need to supervise the living, as he did while alive. Some of the apparitions seen inside the house have been attributed to him perhaps keeping the staff on their toes, as he perhaps keeps an eye on the living. The apparition of Frank Stranahan has been seen jumping into New River as he relives his suicide day after day. They say the entity of Ivy is still a gentle spirit, gracious host with the courageous mind to serve others and is very active indeed. Always a gracious hostess caring for people who enter her home. The third floor attic has a very narrow, difficult set of stairs with no rail leading up to the floor. Staff that have had to go there to retrieve items needed below worry Ivy who doesn't want any of the staff to fall and get hurt. Staff claim to feel an unseen presence close to them and sometimes feel a cold, gentle hand on their back. 
like somebody trying to steady their way up and down the stairs. While alive, Ivy always worried about folks falling from the attic. The friendly, unseen presence of Ivy and her actual apparition is accompanied with the aroma of her favorite perfume. Ivy shows her dislike to some by blowing in their ear and will give others that she likes a warm feeling. The entity believed to be Augustus Cromarty is a quiet but stern, grumpy old man. They say he likes to hang out in his old bedroom, which is now the gift shop, and supervised closely the staff who work there. They believe Augustus shows his displeasure by startling the gift shop staff when they annoy him by changing things around. They even claim that he throws books on the floor and makes the room cold. The entity believed to be Ivy's sister, Pink, is believed to finally be enjoying motherhood. Her unseen presence has been noticed in the parlor. It is thought that Pink and her newest baby are finally together here. If she couldn't have a live baby while on Earth, they believe she has this little baby in her afterlife and can finally experience motherhood at the Stranahan house. She also is believed to yearn to get back at her unfaithful husband. Two orbs travel around together in the parlor that are believed to be the presence of Pink. In a parlor seance led by John Mark Carr, leader of the Southeast Florida Ghost Research, claimed Pink came forward and in the form of EVPs, cheerfully announced her presence and asked where Clark was. Clark was the name of the Fort Lauderdale Sheriff. The entity, believed to be Albert, is believed to still be sticking around at the Stranahan house, and that being dead hasn't improved his character, his maturity, or his manners. Albert, likes to play around, teasing the staff of Stranahan House, much to their discomfort. He knocks things over, moves objects around, shuts doors, and shows a lack of respect for the living. If he doesn't like a person, it's claimed he will yell, Get out. He doesn't just bother staff, but also likes to tease the visitors. They claim He has made his room cold for men and warm for women. He has been rather cheeky and forward with some of the women visitors. When John Mark Carr and his group tried to get him to move on at the request of the staff, Albert replied snidely in an angry EVP. You need suffrage. And of course, the entity of the young Seminole girl's sweet little voice is picked up on an EVP, answering a question from an investigator. Also, EVPs of her singing and chanting have been recorded as well. They also claim that death hasn't affected her sweet tooth. Allegedly, she likes to take candy out of the candy jar that sits on Frank's desk in his office though she can't eat it. It's often found in a pile in the attic. While there are plenty of stories online of those who may haunt the Stranahan house, we went to the internet to find out what everyday people who have visited the home have to say about the claims of paranormal activity. An article from September 2nd, 2012, on TripAdvisor.com, titled, Truly Haunted, says, quote, Recently returned from Fort Lauderdale, visiting several of the historical buildings. I did an EVP session and got several. People fail to see the death that this family went through, along with the suicide of Frank himself. I feel that there was work yet to be done by the family, as they were the founding family. 
She, Ivy, alone brought peace to the New River area with the natives and their culture. She was a devoted teacher as well as a caring and loving person. I sure would like to have known Ivy. I think she offered so much and had so much to tell. I would like to know the name of the assistant she had at her school. Great place to spend a rainy afternoon. An article from Orlando Sentinel website is as follows. The questions have been whispered among those who work there. What was that noise? Did you hear that door close? Is the Stranahan house haunted? Stories have persisted for years that spirits linger in the hundred-year-old home where Fort Lauderdale pioneers Frank and Ivy Stranahan lived. On a recent night, a group of South Florida ghost hunters, using their spirit-searching devices, concluded that long-told tales are true. Quote, We're being watched, end quote, said Sean Jones, founder of the South Florida Ghost Team. Jones, a 38-year-old electrician and part-time ghost hunter, pointed to a ghostly orb or ball of light, her digital camera captured in the house's courtyard near busy Las Olas Boulevard. The Stranahan House, an icon of Old Fort Lauderdale, is one of the most prominent assignments for the fledgling ghost team. Attracted by a tip from a fellow believer, Jones sought permission to investigate, and executive director Barbara Keith gave her consent. Quote, Ivy's here, said Jones, who does the work at no charge. Quote, I know she's here. I feel her presence. Jones will issue a report of the ghost hunt with details of the evidence of spirits. Keith isn't sure what to do or believe or what to do about Jones' conclusions. Quote, I'm intrigued. I want to say they're nuts, but at the same time, she said. Back in 1900, when 52 people lived in the city, trading post operator Frank Stranahan married schoolteacher Ivy Cromarty. He killed himself in 1929 after his bank failed. Ivy died in her sleep in 1971 in an upstairs bedroom. Her father, Augustus Cromarty, also died in that bedroom, now a gift shop. There always have been stories. Quote, You've got to know, it scares me. I remember Shirley Cannon, who was my predecessor, telling me about doors opening and closing, Keith said. The ghost hunters say evidence came many times, in many ways, they thought. Like the gift shop. Quote, When we first came in, there was an impression in the chair. Dan Cronin, a 36-year-old health advisor, said excitedly, as he flashed light into an empty cushioned chair. Quote, And we smelled funny perfume. A lilac he sent. And now it's gone. Later, the sweet, flowery, powdery smell returned. Joan sensed Ivy's presence. Quote, She just brushed right by me. While not everyone believes in the presence of spirits, it seems almost everyone who visits the house has an experience with something. The oldest standing structure in all of Fort Lauderdale seems to be still holding many secrets. And while we may discuss a lot of homes with dark pasts, it seems a lot of good was done here. From Mr. Stranahan, being a pillar of what is now one of the largest cities in all of Florida, to Ivy Stranahan's relationship with the Seminole people. It's truly amazing. But no matter where you stand in all of this, whether you believe or whether you don't, it seems none of that matters when you visit the Stranahan house in Fort Lauderdale. 
because whether you believe or not, you may just see something with your own eyes that you may not be able to explain. So it seems these people were even just the best people in their afterlife, not even just in life. Even to this day, the spirits of these people are claimed to just be like the best. Just through and through. Uh, uh, fabulous outs- human beings. Outside of the brother who had a you know, a, a prostitute issue and well, caught know. diseases. But but you know what? I mean, that's still on the lighter side of most of the things we talk about here. Yeah, agreed. So, I mean, it really is. It's It started a family home, and if the spirits really do exist there, it continues to be a family home to this day. And I love that about this story. It's, it's just different from what we normally do. It's more of like a heartfelt kind of story where these people who were just, you know, revered by the community – you know, have stuck around and still have love for the building that they built a hundred years ago. I love it. I agree. I do too. I really love the family aspect of this and just the loving and caring of these people that go into their family, the home, the town and everything that they did. Now, and it's kind of weird because we do live in Florida and I can't believe I've never heard of this place. I haven't either. You know, this is one of the places that I would love to go see. I, I haven't made up my mind yet whether or not I, I believe it is real. But regardless, just the history behind it and the things that they did. And I mean, look, all the love to Frank, but Ivy is, I believe, like the true star of the story. Absolutely. Because of all the stuff that she accomplished. And, you know, she didn't like tuck tail and leave after Frank died. She stayed there for until 1971. I want you to think about that. She moved there in what was it like 1900 yeah. or something crazy well, they got married i think in 1900 they built the house in, in 1901. 1901 and then she stayed in it till 1971 so she crazy. lived there from the age of 18 to the age of 90 yeah so that crazy is insane literally 70 years insane and like if you're not from florida there are deep old old ties to this like the the settlers and like seminal people mm-hmm. and the fact that you know there were wars going on seminal wars and this lady just befriended them and again like a boss lady who did things decades before other women did them it's just it's incredible it is it amazes me and for the stories from especially like indian tribes and things like that when it came to outsiders no matter what color they were just any outsider outside of their tribe they usually just pushed them away. Nobody could come in. Nobody could. And for her to like break down those walls and barriers and, you know, just befriend them and be on their side and help them. And and they actually saw that she was trying to help, you know? Native American. Sorry. Native American. <laughs> Sorry. I saw your glaring eyes. Native American. <laughs> Sorry. Look, I... I have my ties, but they're I know. Native Americans. I know. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. It's a common mistake. <laughs> but this is a great story. I think of all, I think this is like episode, I don't know, 74. She might be my favorite character so far. For real. I mean. She is so great. Really. This lady needs to be one of the top people in women's history when they talk. Like, this, this she's incredible. But we got to get off of this. I did search the internet for EVPs and stuff, okay. so I couldn't find any. Dang it. But I did find something, and I don't know what is going to be in it. But this is actually from Facebook, and this is from a Facebook account called John Mark Carr. Oh, uh, we know that name. Yeah, and this is from June 24th of 09. So this is kind of an old post. Wow. Um, and it says, in this episode, we dive into the reasons why would there be so many ghosts to the Stranahan house. We would only get clues from them that we received during seances at the Haunted Landmark produced by Comcast. Wow, so, cool. It's about four minutes long, but I, I'd like to hear what they have to say. This could be very interesting. It could just be a bunch of stuff we already heard. So this is really a gamble. But uh, all right, yeah, let's, uh, let's check this out. Cool. I'm excited. Many Stranahan family members lived and died during the last century in their now historic landmark home in Fort Lauderdale. Why do their spirits still live here? The 
Stranahan House is the oldest house in its original location in Fort Lauderdale. The house is open to the public for tours. However, most visitors are unaware of the number of people who long ago died here, most from illness and suicide. While those Stranahan family members are physically gone, their spirits seem to have remained and have manifested themselves to many visitors, workers, and investigators. We get the people that have been actually feel that someone has touched them. Or the temperature changes, it becomes extremely cold. The spare bedroom. The bed in, a bed in that room uh, looks like someone sat in it. Depression in the bed. Um, that's happened when I've come down here to answer the, the uh, burglar alarm in the middle of the night. I heard John, John. I was in the house by myself when I heard my name being called twice. I picked up around this sweet smelling perfume. If all these claims are true, why then are these spirits unwilling or unable to move on into the afterlife? We want to know why there are just so many entities here. We have Ivy. We have Frank. We have Albert. We have a little girl with Pam. We have Pink. So with all these people here, we're going to know what makes them stay. Now, the only residual hunting, which is a bound spirit forever reenacting the same thing over and over again, is Frank. All the rest are intelligent hauntings where we're able to communicate back and forth with the different ghosts here. And when we do, they usually say they're here for each other. They're here because Ivy is here. And Ivy is here because her husband passed away here from suicide. And he can't cross over. He believes that being the son of a Presbyterian minister, that probably if he crosses over, they might be judged. And so he's kind of stuck here in the side of his limbo. Ivy realizes that, and so she's here to stay with Frank. And the rest of the spirits, since they passed away here, come and visit her here, and they get to come and go as they please, but a lot of them stay here because they do believe they're a family, a family ghost. So what does one make of all this? Are there truly ghosts here? The answer to that question lies within each of us. It can only be found by personally experiencing this place. Whether one believes or not, there is much to be gained by visiting the Stranahan House and observing how the early pioneers lived in this once wild area. I'd invite anybody to come and see it. Uh, whether or not it's supernatural or not, the house is embedded with history. Come and see how everything started on the river here. Some of the people, the minute they walk through that door, you can tell that they have had an experience. So that was from John Mark Carr's Facebook page. I don't know if it's still active or not. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure if like his only focus was that place. Right. Um, but I know they've had like seances and stuff. I don't, you could kind of hear it in the background of some of those clips they were doing some investigation and there was like a, a part where there was like a seance but i don't know why they wouldn't have put that in there uh, but uh, supposedly this group has a bunch of evidence of this place i can't find it oh but, but supposedly it exists well i i like that add a little extra that we got from that i mean it wasn't a lot but mm -hmm. there was some extra little stories in there and i, I don't know well I the one it. thing that i really took from that was towards the end they talked about uh, all five spirits were intelligent hauntings except for Frank yeah who was a residual haunting who who just kind of played out his suicide every day yeah so that was interesting I didn't I didn't know that I didn't really you know I didn't really get that out of the story but I was I was actually just having a conversation with my paranormal friend at work the other day about residual hauntings and like who's being, your paranormal friend being on a loop shout her out Amanda Amanda she doesn't listen. The bills suck. They do. She doesn't listen. And she's always like, oh, I don't, I, I have to watch. I don't have time to watch. I'm like, it's not a watching thing. You play it in your mean? car and listen. If you don't have time, this is even better. I know. Okay. <laughs> but I was giving her crap. But we, we were talking about residual hauntings and she was asking, you know, do you, do you believe that that's a thing? And I was like, yes, absolutely. Like people who die just kind of get 
stuck in a loop and they just relive their last parts of their life. Absolutely. I mean, we clearly are believers. Yeah. You know, you just tend to believe a lot more than I do. Yes. That's the only difference here. That is true. So listen, we've heard the history and the mystery behind it all. And every episode, we come to a point where it is time to ask the question that everybody has come to hear, I'm sure. (laughs) The question? (laughs) Even if it's not, it's the one we're going to ask anyways. (laughs) But the question is... Is it real? So, Megan, with everything that you've heard here today about the Stranahan House in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, beautiful, sunny, humid, disgusting Florida, Mm -hmm. do you think it is really haunted? I really enjoyed this place. I really enjoyed the history of it, the people here. I enjoyed their individual stories and everything that came along with it. I wish there was an abundance of more evidence um, that we could dig into. Um, I'm probably going to say, I think this place I'm going to give a 50-50. Okay. I wish there was more evidence, but I truly think that if the little bits of stories that we have heard from people are real, that they've probably pinned it down pretty, pretty good of who it could be. Okay. Um, and as far as residual stuff goes, it was seminal land before. Yeah. And like we've talked about before, you know, the land that these places are built on has things. Oh, the seminal that wars before. happen down here. Absolutely. So, so I'm going to say it's a 50 50 for me. Okay. I wish I could be like, yes, absolutely. Cause I thoroughly enjoyed this place. Yeah. That's a cool one. But, uh, yeah. What about you? I feel like I'm kind of in the same camp. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, I also very much like I love this is this might be one of my favorite places we've done, but it's for reasons that don't really pertain to the show. I love the history of this place Mm -hmm. as far as Ivy and Frank go, being who they are and and what they contributed to being pioneers of the community of Fort Lauderdale during its establishment. However, with the lack of evidence, like there's a lot of talk of this evidence existing. And if you're out there and you do know a lot about this place and you know where we can find the evidence that we will come back on here and we will change our minds. We will say it's different, but with the lack of evidence, I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find a picture. I couldn't find an EVP. I couldn't find anything. I think the stories are wonderful. Uh, I think it adds to the, you know, just the whole story of this place, but I actually don't think it's haunted at all. Mm. I just don't, I, but I think the stories are great and I hope they keep telling the stories. I absolutely, I would love for all the, the paranormal stuff here to be true. I just really think it was just a bunch of tragic accidents happened here. You know, a man did k- kill himself, you know, a kid unfortunately died. Um, and, and that's all very unfortunate, but it's, you know, it doesn't always guarantee paranormal activity in a home, yeah. especially like in a home that was already based around being such a loving home. Right. You know, the whole family, it wasn't like this was a problematic group of people. This was a family, like a tight family, who did a lot of big things. And I I really, really hope that Ivy Cromarty or Cromarty Stranahan is out there in the history book somewhere being talked about for the things that she did. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so, unfortunately, Booze Crew, this week, this place is going to get a big old nothing. Oh, you know, it I happens. really, really like this one. It happens. It happens. But if, I like I said, if you do know where to find some of these EVPs and stuff that they're talking about, let me know. Let us know. Tweet at us or Facebook us or Instagram us or whatever. And let us know where to find them because we would like to see them and we will come back on here and say, hey, we were wrong. Yeah. Hundred percent. You know, we will do it, and I would love to be wrong about a this. Part one. two, take two, whatever or you want to call just, it. You know, in the beginning of an episode, say, yeah. hey, we were wrong. You know, so, and I would love to. This place, more than any other place, I would actually love to be wrong about this place. So. Yeah. And if it wasn't such a, like, four-hour drive from us. Yeah, I know. It's actually probably <laughs> would longer go. than that. I know. The last time I drove to Miami, it was like seven and a half hours. It was ridiculous. That was a long time. And well, I guess that's going to take it out this week, unfortunately. But, man, what a great story. So good. Where? Go Ivy. Go Ivy. <laughs> hey, go Cro- go strain of hands. Frank did his part too to, to establish the, the, the city. But where can they find us? 
They can find us on Instagram at for the booze underscore podcast and on Facebook at for the booze. You can also find us on Twitter at for the booze and on YouTube at for the booze. And if you have a listener story, a suggestion, or just want to say hi, hit us up for the booze 12 at gmail.com. We are always there. Or look, you can send us a message on any social media platform that we're on anywhere. We will most likely answer you in a timely fashion because we're a tiny show and we got nothing else to do. So. And you know what else we like to read? What? Reviews. <laughs> do we? Yeah. Jeez. Five star rate and review. That's you right. You know, all that good stuff. It really, really, really helps out our show. Nothing makes us happier. So. Seriously. If you guys listen and you listen every week, we appreciate you so very much. And, you know, just give us that extra little thumbs up from you yeah, guys. That pat on the back. Yeah. And we, don't forget to check out creepycrate.com. Creepy crate. And hit that hit hit that promo code. What is it one more time? The promo code is booze five. That's, that's right. B O O S and the number five. That's right. Give it to me, girl. Yeah. All right. That's your five dollars off your first order and let us know if you like it or not. I truly, genuinely would like to know. But I think this is gonna take us out for the week. I think it is too. So Thank you, everybody, so much for listening, and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.